Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Scott Park Phillips doing my, uh, whatever these are, interviews. I have with me today Kaz Wegmuller, uh, who's an old acquaintance from, well, probably going back close to 30 years or something like that. Like that. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping today to talk a bit about cosmology because I, I think that this is a, this is a subject that um, overlaps a lot of fields of study uh, that rarely gets um, a deep enough dive uh, in any kind of public realm. So people are kind of hanging out in their own ideas of what cosmology are and I thought of cause because we had a little disagreement <laughs> online like two years ago, yeah. um, and I thought it was productive. And so maybe maybe we can even build up to that, or it's a, sort of a side subject maybe. But um, why don't you tell us what uh, what the characters on the behind you are? Hmm. So that's some calligraphy I did a couple years ago uh, in Chinese Zhengmeng, in Japanese Masayume. And uh, it's actually a, a word, a Japanese word in the dictionary, a compound word, uh, which means a, a dream that has come true, or alternatively, a very lifelike dream. And uh, you can tell from the component characters, the first one, uh, jung or tadashi, uh, means correct, upright, right, righteous, true, authentic. Uh, and mung, the second character, yume, uh, in Japanese uh, means dream. And uh, it just kind of popped into my awareness and kind of became my koan for the last couple of years. I like all the levels of meaning, you know, is, is this the one dream that we are all participants in? You know, what does it mean to be true and upright in the dream? Things like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good thing to dive into. But we maybe we can come back to that. And, sure. and thank you for having that background. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's start with let's start with uh, a background: how we met, what's and what uh, and and your background. Um, uh, so we'll, we met through Liu Ming, who was a teacher of mine for about 10 years, a pretty intimate teacher. Uh, and he was already a teacher of yours at that point. Um, and that was in Santa Cruz. So I studied, started, I met him in, in 95, 96. Yeah. And uh, he's was still going by the name Charles Bellier, which he changed shortly after that. And, uh, well, I started studying with him uh, for a different reason than most people, I think. I, I had been studying, I, I had studied uh, Chinese ceramics, actually, pr yeah. in pretty, pretty deep dive in yeah. my high school years. And, and uh, I, so I kind of had a, connection there and then of course i had been doing martial arts since i was 10 chinese martial arts and then i'd been doing indian classical dance really deep into to it and i had come back i came back from india and i was in such intense culture shock yeah i just was like i first of all i just couldn't understand america yeah. <laughs> it's just like i everything had been thrown up in the air um, but also my experience in India was that uh, my experience of Indian dance was sort of collapsing around me. I, I, I had an idea of learning, of mm -hmm. classical learning that I got from Indian dance. And I saw that in the Chinese martial arts, but the story never matched. Yeah. And so I, I was like, Why? Why is this? So I came with that question. I came to, I heard about Liu Ming and I went and talked to him in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And I thought, after talking to him, I thought he might be able to answer this question. And so I sort of dove into what he was doing. Yeah. Um, 
why don't you well let me ask let me ask i i mean i actually know some of your bio but maybe you you start off and then i'll ask questions sure uh yeah well given uh our sh shared interests and uh yeah so i think i should go back a little farther and say um so I was born in Japan, uh, my mom is Japanese, and my dad is Swiss, and he worked for what was then Siba Gaigi, which is now Novartis, huge mm -hmm. multinational. Pharmaceutical. And he uh, asked to be sent overseas as a young man, and ended up in Japan, met my mom, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I spent uh, a good part of my early life uh, growing up in Japan, and um, I mention this because martial arts is one of our shared interests. And um, already from about age seven or eight, um, I grew up doing judo. And I love, I, I, I'm so glad that I, I was exposed to judo as a young person because um, I've always been kind of, a, uh, kind of a nerd, you know, kind of an intellectual, um, not a natural athlete. Um, and judo really got me in my body and it got me uh, to where I could take care of myself. I, you know, I didn't get in a lot of fights, but when I did, I would throw the other boy to the ground or choke him and that was it. And that hit me well, you know, throughout my life. Um, anyway, um, we then moved to Irvine, California when I was in 10th grade. Talk about culture shock. Um, so while I was in high school, I uh, switched martial arts and I, I did a Korean martial art called Hwarang Do. And Hwarang Do is in the Korean Aiki family, you know, the greater Hapkido family. Mm -hmm. uh, they all contest their various histories, but I won't get into that. Anyway, it was a, a you know, great martial art, lots of high kicks and joint locks and throws and stuff like that. So that was really fun as a young person. Um, then I, I moved to the Bay Area uh, to go to college. I went to Cal, University of California, Berkeley, and I studied anthropology. And, uh, you know, I think a big part of my quest, if you will, has been trying to reconcile East and West, you know, the, the two heritages that, 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 I, yeah, that came through me from my parents and that eventually led me to medicine. But um, during my college days, I studied Tai Chi in Oakland with Chui Wei and Jim Douglas, and they were both uh, acupuncturists. And mm -hmm. um, I finished my degree in anthropology. I got my teaching credential that I'd become a high school teacher which I did for a couple of years. And uh, back then, the Richmond Unified School District oh, was God, going Richmond. under. And yeah. so I lost my job pretty quickly. They got bailed out by the state. And I was you know, despairing. I, it was a really rough couple of years. And uh, I thought, I don't know if I'm cut out to be a teacher. And my Tai Chi teacher uh, said to me, you should be an acupuncturist. And I thought, hmm, I have never once occurred to me as a professional track, mm -hmm. um, but it really appealed to me, just my various interests in Asian culture and medicine and martial arts, uh, it made sense. But um, I didn't want to go into debt going to school, which is expensive. And um, eventually uh, I got a job in the administration at the Oakland uh, Academy of Chinese culture and health sciences. And that was my start in the world of Chinese medicine back in, gosh, early 90s. Um, and the goal all, all along was to then start taking classes and become a licensed acupuncturist. But somehow that is hard to make that materialize working there. Mm -hmm. um, and I eventually, so through the school, I met Charles uh, Bellier. And uh, because Five Branches Institute in Santa Cruz um, was a sister school in the same accrediting union, whatever, as, as the school in Oakland. And he eventually recruited me to uh, come work for Five Branches. 
And uh, <laughs> as I was doing a continuing education, I was uh, organizing continuing education classes for licensed acupuncturists. And mm -hmm. he said, come do that for us. And I said, oh, well, that's awfully kind of you. But what I really want is to study this stuff. And uh, he, uh, he uh, said, well, we'll throw in the education for free. And so I couldn't turn that down. So we moved to Santa Cruz and I went to school. I had a, about a half time job doing CEU stuff for them. Um, and it was, you know, I'm forever grateful that I had that opportunity. As, as far as I know, I'm the only free ride that anyone's ever got at Five Branches. Um, so uh, I should say that I'll, I'll call him Charles just because that's how I knew him. I know he then went by Liu Ming. Um, so we became uh, colleagues and he would drive me to work and you know, we would chat. I would, uh, I would go to some of the, the get-togethers at his house. Um, but I was never a, a formal student of mm. his. Um, mm. I was interested in the Taoism. Um, but I should say, I'm, uh, I've always been an inherently anti-authoritarian person mm -hmm. and a non-joiner. And um, I guess I never felt the draw to join um, his study group. Um, so mm -hmm. I never did. Um, but I, I had a great appreciation for him as a teacher and a human being and I'm very grateful to him. You study anthropology uh, with Michelle Strickman. Michelle Strickman was one of my teachers. He not not in anthropology. I was studying anthropology. He was teaching in the what was then called Oriental Languages program, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I I knew of him uh, because of his Taoist uh, studies contributions. Um, so I quickly jumped at the opportunity to join his freshman seminar, I guess it was my first year of school. And uh, he was a real character, um, brilliant guy. Have you read Chinese Magical Medicine? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I, really, uh, I really appreciated his, his mind. Um, you know, I think among people that are interested in uh, you know, the kinds of things we're interested in, martial arts, medicine, uh, East Asian spirituality. Um, I would say a, a large percentage of such folks um, are searching for answers, you know, about the way the world, the universe works, cosmic principles, that kind of thing. Um, and I think often um, accept rather uncritically uh, a lot of ideas put forth by just, you know, stuff that's out in the popular culture, uh, people teaching Qigong, for instance, you know, what does that even mean, right? And, um, and there's a tendency to, I think maybe romanticize uh, ideas that come out of East Asian spiritual spirituality and religion uh, to meet our own needs. And what I appreciated about Michel Strickman um, as a scholar is he would, I would to, to sum up his approach, I would say he would, he would, Put aside, uh, you know, histories and Confucian classics, the things that most Sinologists study, he wasn't that interested in. And he would find stuff like uh, religious manuals, liturgical texts, letters, uh, uh, accounts of people's dreams. And he... Uh, would delve into um, what were these people, how were these people thinking about life and death and 
their ancestors and ghosts and things like that, um, which I found really refreshing. I should pull back a little bit because I, I doubt that most of my listeners know who Michelle Strickman is and what his role is, uh, although I do discuss it briefly in my new book. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the study of Taoism uh, was largely in, in the West, to use a term, covering France, Germany, England, the United States, and and to some extent Japan, uh, was largely concerned with, uh, uh, was largely um, filtered through uh, modernizing Confucian scholars in the 20th century. And, uh, and there was a kind of... Uh, an obsession with the or a, uh, with the idea of a philosophical Taoism, and that there was a kind of um, that that was a subject, or there was this sort of religious-like thing that was not religious because there was no deity, and that was sort of dominated most of the the studies in the West. And uh, Michael Strickman's teacher, or one of his his uh, his graduate advisor, I guess. Uh, uh, Christopher Shipper, um, or Skipper, I guess it's pronounced, um, went to Taiwan and, from his own description, discovered this authentic Taoism that nobody else knew about that was entirely ritual-based and was had a, a seemingly unbroken lineage back a couple thousand years. And he sort of reported on it and then ended up writing a book and it just created all this excitement. Uh, a couple other um, scholars, uh, Michael Sasso and, and uh, uh, John Lagerway, then went to Taiwan and discovered the same thing but different. And it created a lot of excitement. And then Michelle Strickman sort of shows up on the scene and says, wow, we got a lot of junk to clear out here. Um, because if this is the actual subject, yeah. then all that, what was that other thing we were looking at? That's actually a mistake. And so he, uh, he forever changed the field. And if looking back now, if you were to take a course on Taoism, uh, what you would get is the Strickmanites. Mm -hmm. Um, who are people who are strict, uh, who who view Taoism in a very narrow way, yeah, as that thing which comes from Zhang Daoling, who was yeah. you know had a revelation on Crane Call Mountain in right. the in 50 CE, and what's partly interesting about that is that Charles Bellier or Liu Ming put himself in that camp when I knew him, um, yeah. but as a lineage recipient of that tradition. Yeah. And it was a very weird place to be. Yeah. Um, but I, the other thing I would say is that there, there is another camp, which is yeah. that Taoism is a way more open thing. Mm -hmm. And I have, a, I, I don't really need to be in a camp, yeah. um, but, <laughs> but the way more open camp would describe Taoism uh, as uh, almost held together by the theatrical world, yeah. by the sort of theatrical ritual realm that was the main communicator of what Taoism was to the average person. So that's a kind of a quick overview, um, <laughs> just to get us back to... Uh, uh, all right, l l so I would, like to, I would like to talk to you about, um, about cosmology. And you have some opinions about how we should talk about chi, and so do I. Uh, and I don't think they're the same. So yeah. um, let's dive in there. Sure. Go for it. Okay. What is chi? <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let me frame 
that this whole topic in terms of how I think the, uh, the idea of qi um, can get us in trouble. Um, and I'm speaking as a licensed acupuncturist. Um, well, so basically, I think that the way we talk about qi these days is way too limiting and that we uh, put ourselves into this kind of uh, conceptual prison when we insist on uh, talking about qi as some kind of invisible, heretofore unmeasured scientifically uh, in uh, kind of invisible energy, which is the way it's often framed. And I should say at the outset that I'm not um, dismissing that idea. I'm just saying it's too limiting. And what um, the argument I make is that it's clear from the most ancient days through the height of the Chinese kind of intellectual renaissance of the Song dynasty um, that... 12th century, everybody. Yeah, and just as uh, also <laughs> as a function of uh, Chinese as a pictographic polysemous language, um, that she really uh, refers to the constituent basis of everything in the universe, whether it's energetic or material, uh, physical, or even within our bodies, uh, things that we would talk about in terms of emotions and uh, uh, sensations and feelings, these are all subsumed under chi. And um, so, you know, if, if you get in a discussion with a strict uh, scientist, um, in the Western sense, um, about uh, acupuncture or qigong, for that matter, um, you can quickly um, kind of end up at an impasse because, uh, you know, if, if I'm talking about invisible energy, he'll say, well, you know, what is that? Measure it. Show me what that is. And I don't mind arguing with people. I'm pretty opinionated and, you know, we'll, we'll talk to people about most anything. But I think that you're having the wrong argument. I think instead we have to, speaking of cosmology, we just have to look at how different cultures conceive of the universe and all its manifestations. And I would argue that qi is a broadly applicable term that applies to all the stuff of the universe, including the sensations in our bodies, including the weather, including material structures like mountains and rocks, um, and, and anything else. And uh, this broadness of definition actually uh, makes, makes it so useful that um, I think in the Western world, we've become so analytical and reductionist that we just want to just hone in on what a thing is and we really need to know that whereas the Chinese view kind of steps back and sees the patterns that emerge when you yeah look at it in a larger way. Well let me try to draw iron man that for you a little bit strengthen it up. Uh, so there's there's a value in having the the diagnoser and the treater in a medical realm be open sure. and use use language and, and strategies for thinking to be open and that's specifically because all patterns connect to larger patterns. And if what you're doing in diagnosis is finding a pattern and very slightly altering it, 
back to something we'll call health, uh, you want to be, you want, the, the, the further out you can see the pattern or the more connections you can make, the more capacity you have to, to, to step into these feedback loops. Yeah? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. And, and it, it, it broadens the, the therapy uh, from I'm going to stick a needle here and give you this formula to, you know, maybe you should spend more time at the beach or, or, you know, do you talk to your children <laughs> or whatever? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. Well, all right. So that's good. Now I have a different opinion, um, yeah. but, I, but I also, I think, I think what I would like to do for larger audience is point to um, some different phenomena. For, for instance, you, you have an article, I'll link to it below, of, it's sort of saying in, in, a, in summary, you know, a, a slightly different terms, but what you just said. Yeah. And I can refer people to that. Um, and one of the points you make is that Taoism is a kind of a separate tradition from um, from medicine and in the Chinese context. And I think I would argue differently. I think what I would argue is that um, Taoism at certain points uh, was had, had centralized and then it diffuses and then it centralizes and then diffuses, you know, in sort of waves of two or 300 years. So it's done that six or eight times. And so you and when every time that happens is you get these branches flying off that some of them don't make it back <laughs> right yeah. and then and then you have the in you know the theater at, during the Song dynasty and and after by the Ming is infused with Taoism and is infused with medicine you know and and e even literature you know uh, a lot of people learn about medicine through um sort of comic literature you know, where some two clowns would get up on the stage and make jokes about all the different types of medicine that comes from poop, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's a certain amount of, I think, comic medicine out there in, especially in the literary realm where it's like, you know, put a, put a vial of, of cat urine in this corner and it will keep the demons away, you know, that there's a, there's a very serious version and there's a almost comic version. They kind of exist together. Um, uh, or what was really serious is suddenly everyone lightens up, and that uh, part of the the problem of TCM, you know, learn these points; these are where the needles go for this treatment. Is that it sort of denies the fact that medicine itself um, was diverse and then often connected to other things, sure. and. Um, and I guess I would just like run through a couple because people probably don't know all these books. Have you read the Expressiveness of the Body? Uh, no, Kuriyama. Uh, Kur oh, you yeah, should. I've come across the yeah. I've read about it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, I'd like to read it. So he does a really interesting thing where he says, you know, the Greeks, uh, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Chinese had a kind of similar idea of medicine, and and he sort of looks. They were all look. They were taking the pulse. Yeah. And they were making a lot out of it. And to summarize a really great book, he ends up saying, because of dissection mm -hmm. and views about the musculature and the sort of the, 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 the artistic embodiment of manhood, mm -hmm. the West went in a certain direction. And because of dreaming <laughs> and because of uh, the traditions in Taoism of visualization, mm -hmm. um, medicine in the east went another direction and so you have this this idea of taking the pulse where it's incredibly visual you know uh, and sensual um in the east where where it or almost poetic yeah um, and uh, who else would i bring in um everybody has to read paul unschild when they go to acupuncture school but i I think a lot of people are not reading his more recent book, the What is Medicine, mm -hmm. which 
which sort of summarizes, you've probably heard this material, you know, he sort of summarizes, he says, Chinese medicine was basically over once, you know, Western style hospitals started build, being built on mass in the early 20th century in China. And it, it uh, and he's not quite right there, but he, that's what he says. Yeah. And then he's, he says, uh, you know, and then like it hit the hippie movement, like it's what survived sort of hit the hippie movement. And, and there was like a, a rebellion against everything normal. Cause the hippies were like, we want different food. We want different types of cars. We want different types of everything. So they wanted different yeah. medicine, obviously. Um, and so there's this sort of, he, that's what he says, he sort of pulled this thing out and sort of reframed it. But it's impossible to put the, you know, what he, he summarizes as DNA, you know, the science back in the box. So these things yeah. keep talking to each other. Yeah. Um, well, there's a bunch of other people. Uh, you've read Nancy Chen, though. She was my TA at Cal. And I have read her uh, Breathing Spaces. Good book. Yeah. Oh, she was your TA. Okay, that's yeah. good. That's a good yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just didn't give you ask you a question. I just made a bunch of statements <laughs> about what I think the subject is. So uh, let, 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 me, uh, let me dive in. So what – okay. I agree, actually, with your – with chi as this big subject um but i think as as a martial artist and whatever it is i am i i really don't like that limitation at all yeah um but i've never really been into treating people right um i i like to work enough for sure as a as, as a martial arts i'm sure you say that again that the the internet just messed up say that again um I just said, as a martial arts teacher, I'm sure you've done a fair amount of twena on people's yeah. injuries. Yeah. Well, I actually taught at the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in, in San Francisco yeah. and had, you know, that was, that was part of what I was doing was, yeah. was teaching twen the twena connection to, to movement. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in, in general, trying to explain what Chinese medicine was to yeah. these students who weren't actually getting answers. They were like studying it without getting an answer. So it was a pretty interesting job. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so let's, let's jump to this question. What is the body? Like, cause I think that that's where it chops off and where, where that, where it, it gets rough. And I'll just give you um, one of what I've been telling people is yeah. that in the West, we have this simple idea of a separation between the mind and the body. And then we might have the environment as a sort of yeah. separate concept. And the Chinese view is that there is Jing, Qi, and Shun. And these three... Uh, are inseparable, but they mix together. Um, in in the big cosmology version, they're seen as sometimes as densities. But the, in the body realm, qi gets gets the quality of animation, whereas jing is involved with reproducing, but also just substance. So, if you take a picture of me. You're mostly seeing Jing, but you might catch some expression, right? Which would be Qi. Yeah. And then they kind of, and then, and then, like, it, what is Shun ends up. Uh, I, um, Elizabeth Chen, by the way, is the person who really explained this well. I think is that w what they did in the medical books is they just just took everything they that was sort of upfront about neurology from the, in the 1960s, and they just said oh that's shun <laughs> uh but shun is this you know the bigger a bigger part maybe that connects you to Tao or emptiness you want to want to take a shot what is the body uh yeah so what i would 
What I would start with is that I think Chinese thinking is, despite the proliferation of theories and concepts um, about everything, including the body, I think that um, a good place to start is uh, really the unknowability of anything. And that, you know, the famous first line from the Tao Te Ching, right? The, the way that can be weighed is not the, the, the real way. Um, and that therefore any explanation of phenomena um, is uh, uh, it is, tr is trying to describe the indescribable. And so, yeah, Jing, Qi, and Shen is a very old tripartite way of talking about the body and, and a useful one. And in TCM, even in TCM, that's come down to us as, yeah, Jing as the, yeah, genetic, sexual, you know, reproductive stuff, stuff slash non-stuff. And Qi as being more, yeah, the dynamic, engendering, animating quality, and Shen as, you know, what it is that shines out of your eyes, the consciousness, the spirit. Um, and I think that's a, it's, that's a useful um, division. And I, and I like how it uh, fits in with the three centers model, the three Dantian, where the lower, the pelvis and the lower body have to do more with Jing and the middle have more to do with Qi and the top has more to do with Shen. And, and that's useful for different practices one might engage in. But Chinese medicine is also super pragmatic so that in one clinical instance, it may be uh, more useful to talk about a pathology in terms of the Shen or the Qi or the Jing. But in some other uh, presentation, you might discard that model and talk more about the six levels or the four stages or the 12 channels or the eight extraordinary meridians. Uh, there's all kinds of models to play, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, medicine is this, saying the internet connection's unstable, I don't know if you're hearing this. But anyway, that medicine... I can hear you. <laughs> um, ...is an empirical tradition where you learn from your teachers uh, what model is most applicable, applicable for different kinds of things happening. Um, so I think there's this sort of pragmatic um, way of using what fits the situation. Um, now, when we get into acupuncture, one of the things that makes it um, kind of exotic, kind of unlike most other medicines, other cultures, traditional medicines, the the whole needle sticking thing is kind of unusual. Um, so, <sighs> this whole idea that there are these channels in the body, it sounds like we're back to the whole invisible energy thing. You know, the way it's talked about in the textbook, it sounds like there's these three-dimensional tubes through which flows some ethereal substance slash energy that you manipulate when you stick a needle and do certain things. You're helping to drain that out of an overly full situation, or you're boosting or adding to it in a deficient or weakened situation. Um, this implies a, a way of thinking about the body as these interconnected circuits, if you will, which we call channels or meridians. So that's one thing we could talk about since it's a common oh, place. Oh, let me just punch a hole in that. Um, the, yeah. 
there, there's a, I forget who this is. Uh, it, it's in, it's in a book on male and females. It's called, oh yeah, masculinities, Chinese masculinities, Chinese femininities. It's a bunch of essays, and one of them is all about uh, how um, the the normative use of the word blood in Chinese medical texts in the 1800s um, is just is for women, and the normative description of blood for men is just called qi. So I mean, now this is a moment in Chinese history, right? And it's and it's also somebody trying to make an interesting point for an essay, but it's uh it actually fits that that fluid flowing thing that was became a really big part of the conversation in the in the early 20th century. Um so it but but it really doesn't fit very well with um <laughs> with these other notions of chi, and then if if we, if there's two systems for flow in the body, and one of them we can't find, that's a problem, right? Yeah, yeah. So so the the yin yang way of talking about that would be to say that well, yeah, but chi encompasses everything from the most material to the most energetic or ethereal, and that in the body the main manifestations of qi are qi and blood where you know the qi is like not in the grand sense but that got cut ethereal. what not in the grand I'm sense but what oh. so if you're talking about qi and blood in the body it's kind of like well the qi is everything in the universe in the human body it mostly chi and blood, and that the blood is more material and the chi is more ethereal, and therefore you're not finding it with a meter of some sort. Oh right, right, right. Oh yeah, that that would be a good that would be good out. <laughs> um, well, so my so my point is that these are just concepts, and that when we try to hold on to them and say look, the Chinese have discovered the truth about the body. There's these five organs and 12 channels and there's this chi and there's this blood. You know, it doesn't work that way. No. In history, we're trying to describe it. We're trying to interact with it. We're trying to have outcomes therapeutically. And these are all ways, it, but it would be a mistake to say, this is the one truth about the human body. Right, because they were not obsessed with truth in that sense. They were practical, as you said. That it's it's a it's a practical approach. And and I and I think it's I think it's good to point out that of all the things we could point to in Chinese culture as a Tao Yin or uh, you know or or talismanic medicine or the golden elixir or or, or uh, you know Buddhist sutras or, like. All of those things are slightly less practical than this medicine thing, mm -hmm. um, which which right, because they're in the subjective realm of internal practice, where the shen or the imagination can make it into anything. Shun, you are, I, your our internet connection isn't that good, but you just said, but the, a notion of shun could show up anywhere. Right, well, what I was saying was, in a in the subjective realm, if rather than medical interaction with another human body where you're doing things, when you're doing the things within your own body and your own mind, especially, then the shen as imagination can do whatever you want it to do. Um, so I've been working with a model and, and let's, let's bat it back and forth a little bit, um, from practicing. So what I learned from, uh, from Charles Bellier, Liu Meng was, uh, was called Zouang or sitting and forgetting. So the, that's sort of the, he also, he taught a lot of other things too, but. Uh, that was sort of the ground 
thing, and it's, it's, it's a particular type of meditation which is non-conceptual. So it's, the teaching is always about directing you away from what you just thought you achieved or learned. It's, it's how to stay with not knowing. Um, and I, I would say a sort of side effect of that uh, is an experience of emptiness or limitless emptiness. And, uh, and this other meditation practice called the Golden Elixir is a, uh, he, which he also taught, sort of arrives spontaneously. And it's just another way to look at what happens when you're still. Uh, or it's a way to look. It's a way to look at it and start adding names, right? Start adding labels at a kind of base level, kind of a, a return to some sort of original experience. But you start naming it, and it never gets pinned down, yeah. really, because it's always about returning to the source with new inspiration. And so, one of the ways he taught this was this very. Uh, uh, detailed visualization practice of uh, zi wei or, or, or the, the deity of the north, uh, also known as Jan Wu, the perfected warrior, uh, and these visualizations, and you visualize the deity outside your body and then above your head, and then you become the deity, and then you visualize another deity. Uh, and there are, uh, there are many different versions of this you know, in, written, written down and historic. Taoist practice, um, but it it also like in in the twentieth century you see these science scientized simplified versions of the same practice described as chi rising up the back and coming down the front, and just like this is just circulating up the du run channel, and then landing in the dantian coming up to the top of the head, and dripping into the heart and expanding out in all directions, and it it's. At first blush, it's like, how could these possibly be the same? Uh, but from the point of view of practice, it becomes quite obvious that they're the same and that there are many other descriptions of this phenomenon. Um, yeah. And one of, the, one of the simple descriptions up front is that in stillness, Jing and Qi distill from each other. So that was weird, right? Because it doesn't line up at all with any medical text, really. Um, and though maybe you could dispute that. And I think, I think I'll just sort of jump back for a second. I want to continue this, but I want to jump back and sort of reference a concept, which is that there's martial artists, since I have a lot of martial artists listen to me, so many martial artists uh, are like, you know, they do martial arts and they hear about qi and they're like, well, I just don't understand qi. So they're like, I'll study Chinese medicine, <laughs> right? I mean, that's like yeah. a really common story. And then they're in there studying Chinese medicine and one of two things happens. One is they're like, okay, this is never going to answer the questions I had. Yeah. Uh, and another is they just get into sort of what I would call rote repeat mode. Yeah. And they just like, this is what they say, this is what they say. But they never actually do what you were saying is consider it um and so that was i guess that's a tag on to what you said earlier but i wanted to 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 to, to sort of get at this idea of uh, jing and chi distilling so what that creates is the immortal egg and why it's called the golden elixir so so chi floats off the body so the physical body becomes empty of all intent or desire you could say and chi floats off and that's a sensation. It's actually a body sensation. Um, but if I'm talking to a sciencey guy, yeah. um, <laughs> I would say it's periperceptual space, and it's the brain actually has an awareness of this thing, and you can distill it as a distinct experience. Uh -huh. And there's something beyond that, which is like beyond what we can reach, and that's shun. You know, it's a spatial imagination. And so you're now in this egg when you're still. And the, what I call the internal martial arts are the practice of moving without disrupting the egg. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. <laughs> oh, 
All right, so I'll tie it to medicine and see if I can get you to come out with something. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because it's practical, and I can say, here's the test, right? And so it doesn't have to align with medicine. It really doesn't. Um, and it doesn't have to align with somebody else's idea of meditation, although I can link it to, to more overtly to Taoist practices, which are specific visualizations and then visualizations inside of emptiness. You know, but emptiness has to be established in the body before you visualize inside. Um, but in medical terms, what I would say is that this practice um, creates the consolidation of Jing. Mm. So the, the physical body itself actually moves inward and, becomes, and begins a process of self-healing, self-rectifying, and self-simplifying. Uh, going back towards in, in, a, in um, an emergent primordial, that is uh, the, the body as it evolved in its simpler patterns start to sort of take over um, and yeah. a spontaneous healing arises, which I would call the consolidation of Jing. It actually feels like everything is getting denser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting idea. So what I would say is in terms of internal martial arts, um, see, I'm that the Jin Dan model uh, is as prevalent in the Taiji Bagua Shingi traditions intrinsically as part of those martial lineages, mm -hmm. but I'm not poo-pooing it at all. I think what you touched on is really interesting um, about the bubble, um, because if you learn a weapon, um, and they've, you can extrapolate what I'm going to say from studies done with monkeys and extending their perceptual maps when they use sticks to reach termites and stuff like that. But when you learn a weapon, you're literally expanding uh, your perceptual range as can be mapped neurologically uh, in the brain. So if that's true, um, why could you not accomplish something similar with a practice which expands your range out in a bubble around you um, through a practice like you described. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and then for what you're saying about um, this consolidation of the Jing and health, um, I think that uh, acupuncture um, channels and acupuncture points um, have something to do with the remnants of the connections uh, left over from when we were a single cell, you know, sperm meets egg, and then the zygote, and then the splitting starts forming these, these cleavage lines, you know, in what's becoming a multicellular organism. And that um, I think that the acupuncture points are left over uh, from those networks of splitting and cleaving. And so if that is true, um, it's possible that medicine um, working through the body with needles or touch or movement um, are helping us get in touch or somehow access this primordial unity, which was a literal fact at the mm. very very beginning of our lives so that's really yeah. interesting. yeah you're you're um 
that theory was really sort of detailed by this guy, and I can't remember his name, and I was looking around the room for his yeah, book yeah. just now. Yeah, the, the guy that um, – Chinese-American or Chinese last name, right? Um, yeah, it's Skeletal Something is the, is the, oh. t in the title. I forget the title, but yeah. it, it's – I, you just described the book. I mean, it's that's that's it. And he describes this idea that a needle is like um, uh, is replicating the process of of a, a of a of a slug like creature getting poked and then reacting. Um, that, that that there's an evolutionary pattern in relationship to the way to whether you go into the needle or you move away from it. He yeah. has a, that's he furthers the theory. Yeah, in, in I that haven't theory. read that. Yeah. Oh, you haven't? Oh, I, I'll I'll put the link down below because it it is pretty much what you just said, um, and I guess those things spin around in the ethos, and people put them into books sometimes. He's Australian, actually. I think. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, it, it, you know you mentioned the monkeys, right? There's this famous study of monkeys, which is they haven't replicated much. They've replicated in other ways, but they haven't done this one because it got a lot of complaints because they. They tied a monkey to a chair and gave him oh, a yeah. rake and yeah. said, you know, and it, monkeys really like raisins. So he was like, he had a rake in his hand, which he could hold, but he didn't have the skill to get the raisins over to him. Yeah. And it took 11 days. And they did this to a bunch of monkeys. And there was like some that could do it in nine and some that could do it in 11, but it was pretty close. And so yeah. they used that to measure um, – the, the speed at which synopses grow in the brain. Yeah. Um, and it's like one millimeter per week or something like that. Um, yeah. Whatever, it's like a thing. It's, and, and yeah. that, and, but the humans developed this very early and you can build on it. So the monkeys in this test, or if they're apes or something, um, chimps, uh, could do it with a mirror backwards mm. on day 11. Yeah, like it's, they could get the raisins here, but they could do it in a mirror backwards, and they yeah, could yeah. also do it on a video camera where they couldn't see the the raisins, but they could see the rake. I mean, yeah. they couldn't see themselves, but they could see the rake. So, uh, it it, uh, it there's another study that was just done that I heard about where uh, they were showing that people, you know, with the blindfold on, if you they hold a sort of rod that vibrates. They can tell if you tap the rod, they can tell you where mm. on the rod you're tapping, you know, how mm. close to the end, how close to the hand, right? Um, and they took someone who had lost all um, proprioception in the arms. The proprioception is what allows people to know where their arm is in space. So yeah. this person could look at their arm and go, oh, there's my arm. But if your arm was over here, they had no idea whether their arm was up or down. They didn't know where it was. So when it was moving, they didn't know. But they yeah. still had touch, some touch capacity in their hand, right? Because there's some kind of brain damage problem, right? Or ner nervous system damage. But they could still touch stuff. Because they could touch, they passed the test perfectly, holding the rod. They knew exactly where it was in space. So yeah. it, it was using touch. So the touch was going into the proprioceptive part of the brain for objects outside the body. Right. Um, yeah. So that was like... This mechanism, so when I talk to scientists trying to get them to understand what I'm doing, I'm yeah. like, this mechanism, it's there. It's absolutely there. If you open a door and you realize you're on the second floor rather than the first floor, your whole brain will just rewire. In your, your experience of space will just instantly rewire. And that's because we walk around with a, an unconscious picture of the world we're in. And yeah. we just carry it with us. It's efficient. You know, that's my yeah. picture of the world here I'm holding. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. I, think that, I think that the language of Jing Qi and Shun uh, was really getting at that. And that um, uh, I really, I, I have no hesitancy to use the word Qi in my teaching because I'm really specific about what I'm talking about. You gather Qi to the back. That means the visualized space that's close to your body, right? It's, it's, a, it's a thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a process and a thing. Yeah. So I think for, for the, for the science-y type people who are watching, I think we need to talk about fascia. Oh, really? Well, go for it. Yeah. All right. So... 
So I can get you. That, I can get you blocked on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the reason I bring it up is, in terms of acupuncture, I I think that um, I think that the fascia system is um, not only obviously involved in pathologies having to do with tightness and holding and injury and things like that, um, but that it's also the system through which the acupuncture needles have their effect if we're speaking anatomically and scientifically. And because um, it's so interesting that the, the connective tissue fibers um, have been shown to be these dielectric arrays that conduct electricity. And they clearly also uh, conduct mechanical forces. And the way I think about acupuncture in terms of what's really happening um, in terms of... <laughs> Uh, right. uh, you know, without um, losing a listener who finds it difficult to think in terms of chi, for instance. Um, it, it seems to me that there are two main lineages of acupuncture. The first, much more widespread, um, involves sticking a needle through the skin into the interstitium or the surface of a connective tissue plane. And with the listening fingers, detecting and manipulating tugs and vectors in that connective tissue. Um, this is if the person... That's what they're doing. There is a third. Say that again. This is if the person knows wise. what they're doing. That's what you said. We have a slight delay yeah, in our yeah. internet. It's working. Sure. Yeah. So what I'm saying, if, if the person they're doing, they are physically interacting with the vectors at play in these lines of fascia, which connect through the whole body. And therefore you can get to a neck from the ankle because these, uh, fascial layers interact and propagate um, not just physical forces but um, electrical signals. But what I was going to say was so this one image uh, manipulates and interacts with things happening along those fascial lines. Um, the second, physically through needle manipulation, the second lineage. Uh, which is what I practice, and this may sound a little woo-woo for some people, but the second lineage uh, almost entirely on the electrical energy, which accompanies changes in fascial configuration. And what this, this is, uh, is usually called non-insertion acupuncture, and it mostly in Japan, although one of the ancient nine needles in in Chinese acupuncture is um, uh, a non-insertion needle. In Japanese, it's called a teishin. Anyway, hang on. So I, I know all this. Exactly hang on. I know all this, uh, so it's easy for me to follow. But uh, um, but just say it. Say it again. Like, the, our internet, for some reason, is a little disrupted right sure. now. It's like really unfair. Sure. So standard acupuncture needle. <laughs> yeah, standard needle. Now here are my five star needles. needle. <laughs> uh, seven star, yeah. So seven these star, yeah. thicker needles are a form of non-insertion needle. Um, I make these myself out of meteorite iron, and not only do I have the pleasure of using tools, um, I'm convinced that some of the earliest uh, acupuncture needles were made from meteorite because it was the only source of high high purity iron around prior to the discovery of smelting. Um, but anyway, these thicker needles have a rounded end and a pointier end. 
And just by touching the skin, uh, the acupuncturist feels with, with the fingers that are holding the very, just above the tip, and then the tip contacts the skin, the other hand can be used to manipulate or hold, but the main sensing happens right down here. And when we say the chi arrives, uh, you feel this tingling feeling, which to me feels very electrical, and that comes and goes, and then you're done with that point. And as far as I can tell, there's two things happening with non-insertion acupuncture. A, non-insertion is a kind of insertion because now we know that immediately below the skin and above the muscle is the, inter the newly discovered organ, uh, which has been widely reported on, of the interstitium, which is the foamy layer of fascia between the muscle and the skin. So just with pressure with your finger or with a needle, you are accessing the connective tissue and in a, you are partly doing some physical manipulation just because there's a little bit of pressure. But most you're assessing what's happening through these electrical feelings that happen, which we call qi. Um, and the thing that happens with that, I believe, is that because the metals that are used, gold, silver, iron, are electronegative, which means they readily contribute electrons into a conductive medium, I believe there's a two-way communication, not just from a muscle with its fascia that's relaxing, which then you feel happen elsewhere at the needle, but also the needle contributes a flow into the tissues. And I believe that traumas of different sorts whether they're physical, you know, whether you sprained your shoulder, or whether they're mental, emotional, um, are held that the mind isn't just in the cranium, but is spread throughout the body. And that traumas, memories, uh, experiences of all sorts are held in the body. And that when you apply a needle, um, it's so interesting. Not everybody, but some people will feel that sensation of the chi or bioelectricity, whatever you want to call it, going into their bodies and doing different things. And I've come to believe that um, Chinese culture, which is famously averse to uh, talking about one's psychological issues um, you know East Asian culture tends to believe in the kind of the, the holding in of the true self rather than sharing it with the world kind of the opposite of here um, it's so interesting that they the Chinese culture has hit upon a therapy which is a can be a kind of wordless psychotherapy where through the sensations in your body going to places that are holding memories or traumas um, can, there's a kind of an autodidactic process that can happen where these sensations, which uh, together with the letting go of holding places that happens through acupuncture and other physical therapies um, has this therapeutic effect, which is more than just physical. Um, and I think most research in Chinese medicine, you know, doesn't talk about this stuff. People want to prove that Chinese medicine helps menopausal hot flashes or cures knee pain. And they ask very, yeah. very limited research questions like that. And I think it's much more interesting, you know, if you query under acupuncture patients of the experiences they have on the table, all kinds of interesting stories emerge. And that's um, much more fascinating to me. What happens when you get an acupuncture treatment? What happens when you engage in a meditation practice? What happens when you watch art? Um, anyway, I'm off topic here, but. No, no, I think that's, that's, that was good. Um, I, 
Well, I, I guess, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, hypnosis and ritual mm. as, you know, because the West, the West, I, I, the West is still a useful term, um, even if the West is in the East and well, all that other stuff. Uh, <laughs> whatever, we could call it biomedicine. Biomedicine happened on to, to hypnosis before it was so self-critical. And, uh you know, and and there's there's all this stuff. Well, um, Kapchik, who wrote the famous book on um, Webb, who has no Weaver, you know, went into placebo studies at right. Harvard, and placebo studies have gone a long way, but they can't they still have no explanation for hypnosis. Why is and and the, and the numbers are very strange. There's something like you know, ten percent of the population um, can be you know, 90% of any ailment can be fixed by hypnosis. And then uh, something like, you know, 30, 30% can be cured some lesser percentage of the time. That hypnosis, but again, we don't really know what hypnosis is. There's no, it's not, it's really hard to define that category, but they don't think it's, it's placebo either. They think it's something else. And so I, I like the, uh, you know, what you're describing when you describe the treatment. And, and uh, I, I plan to do a couple of interviews with other people who are just, just doing very light touch, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And oh. visualizations too, right? Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, there's this, I think there's a distinct difference. I'm just this, this sort of this an aside. I think there's a difference between, Doing the practice and and you're allowing your imagination, sensory organs to go into the body versus what happens outside. Yeah, you know because those two things are are. are you, are you say you? Do you mean the practitioner of? Yeah, the yeah, but obviously the person on the table is doing that too. Yeah, right. It's simultaneous. Yeah. Um, and so there's like there's this sort of like guided ritual experience. And yeah. maybe some element of hypnosis, but not wordy hypnosis, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, in, we really don't sense. know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. or, or kind of entrainment, perhaps, of two people's fields or something like that. Yeah. 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 I find that, you know, when I give a treatment, I always end with the person lying face down and a hand on their sacrum and a hand on their head eventually i end up hand over their heart and hand over their kidneys and just touching so lightly that i'm almost off the body yeah and people almost always fall asleep in in that last minute um and it's and it's super relaxing and it feels it feels, I feel like it's after doing all this stuff, it's, it's giving a moment for the person to come back to themselves and let themselves fill space. And, um, and I wonder if that, like kinesthetically, that feeling of someone touching you gently and calmly, and then that gradient disappearing to nothing, is something similar to what you're talking about with your jindan bubble, which then expands, or I don't know if expands is the word, but merges with emptiness. Mm -hmm. And that if that experience in the body-mind is similar to that of a meditator who is having that, that experience of emptiness or merging or, or uh, yeah, I think you just made the connection. So now you have to bring it back to dream. So what is a dream? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do we, do we store dreams in the kidneys? Is it... <laughs> <laughs> is there some reversal that's going on? One of the other ways I would describe the golden elixir, especially when, when I start talking about the fruition, is a list of things that reverse. And that's super weird. And, uh, and, but, you know, um, this like saying that, you know, that life, so one of the, a mathematical way to describe life 
is um, that if you drop, you know, like if you take a glass of water and you drop a drop of ink into it, it spreads immediately throughout the water. And that's not life. Life, when you drop it in, it, it might expand, but then it's going to shrink again. Like it contains itself. It's in, in whatever medium, life is always self-making, self-repeating, self-organizing right. toward a, some kind of center. Um, and, and so, um, uh, well, I totally forgot where I was going. Dream. Dream, I know, right? <laughs> it's, it just takes you away. Uh, so, so, um, oh yeah, so that, but that's like, there's a concept of reversal there. So that, that what life is, is always, um, like death is dispersing, getting further and further apart, right? And it might, you know, as the body gets older, it might get parts that are really tight, but it also gets parts that are really loose, right? And, and so the body, the body is sort of falling apart and then trying to hold together. And so the Jing really, you know, like um, uh, Yang Jing, you know, is, is the body consolidated is all brought together as a single unit. Um, and, but what happens in dream, you know, like, you know, all the muscles are gone in a sense, like you're out. Um, and it's like the it's like what or what happens to the body, right? The spatial imagination is is traveling all over, or it's it's maybe it's like a summer like the yellow submarine. It's traveling through the body like a submarine exploring. I mean, it's really weird. It is really weird. I have no answers. <laughs> yeah, you know, I my basic position is. Uh, is an agnostic, uh, non-religious one. You know, um, I, you know, as, as far as life goes, you know, we're born and we die, and in between we have this experience, and we can speculate forever about the before and the after, but you know, it's hard to know, and. And even in the in-between, this part that we get to experience now, um, it's such a mystery. And, and dreaming is, is so weird. And it's, it's such a big part of our time here. Um, so I don't have a metaphysical, I don't, I don't think about it metaphysically. Um, but it seems to be a, w a way of, a way for us to incorporate um, and and try to make sense of our experience, and it's pretty cool that in that realm we have such freedom and uh, uh, yeah, dreams are weird. Yeah, I, I mean, you have this. So there's another phenomenon. I, I'm getting, I'm pulling us further away for no particular reason, except that I like to open things up. Yeah. We were talking before we started about these, uh, uh, before we started videoing about uh, uh, this, this, this uh, video called Two Set, where these, these two violinists who are right. yeah. really good violinists, but they're comedians and, and they interview people who are better than them. But, you know, you're listening, trying to go, oh, you know, it, it's, it's really a lesson about, the, their videos are all really about what is classical music, right? Because everybody in, this, it, in their world has memorized perfectly, I mean, in terms of down to the, 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 the phrasing the, and the, the feeling and, and, and the, the, the violin stroke of these really long, elaborate, pieces of classical music yeah. so they can do the hula hoop while they're playing it or or you know or like change the tone of a string and like correct in mid you know in, in while they're playing they they can they can they can imitate other violinists right yeah. which 
which, you know, make all the faces and stuff while they're playing. So it's so deep, like it's in their jing, you could say. It's like embedded in what they are at some level. But we all know that, you know, if you gave them like uh, some weird sedative, they wouldn't be able to do it, right? Uh, but, but they also are talking about like daydreaming. Like, can you do this incredibly elaborate mental task and daydream at the same time? And I, I think that a lot of what, what I do in terms of like, like, the, like Tai Chi is, is, the, is the best example. When I mean, you're doing this pattern that you've memorized, you know, I memorized 30 years ago or something. It's, it's really, really precise. And yet it doesn't really matter that it's really precise unless you're telling a story. Yeah. Um, but allows for this incredible amount of dreaming to happen. It's almost as if it was designed so you could practice dreaming during the day. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that that in itself is some kind of healing process, although healing isn't quite the right word. Yeah. Yeah. And on a similar note, I have to say one thing I appreciate about you when I've seen your videos and just your whole approach is this aspect of play mm. and i think play is so important is so intrinsically healthy and that it's it's something we overlook a lot you know when people get really into health <laughs> you know <laughs> you need to get real neurotic and to <laughs> to my dietary regimen and I'm going to do my Tai Chi every morning at 6.30 and, and you know, I think yeah. that's kind of the opposite of what I would consider a, a healthy approach to life which, which has to include this element of play and so when you talk about Tai Chi as a domain in which you can dream while awake Mm -hmm. um, and if I think about how much fun I ha have in dream, I love dream, I love sleeping and I love dreaming. Um, mm -hmm. There's, yeah, there's just something playful and good uh, <laughs> about it. Um, so yeah, when it comes to martial arts and healing and life in general, I, I, I think that that element of play is super important. It shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah, play. Um, I, I <laughs> that's definitely my story. Thank you for that. Um, uh, the uh, do you know Dr. Senki? This guy in L.A. What's the last name? It's Senki. It's a, It's it is. It's is he Japanese. Japanese. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He has the huge volume on esoteric acupuncture. That's something. the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know him, but. I thought I might get an interview with him at some point. Um, he, uh, I just brought him up because he has this whole, he basically just said, you know, I'm just not that into healing people. Um, I want people that I want to go on a spiritual journey. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's the open, like he's like holding down yeah. the, the most open you can be about yeah. acupuncture. I think yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, he has these sort of, he has these needling patterns that are about like sacred geometry and like that take the body to some other dimension. I mean, anyway, I just thought I'd bring it up because it's sort of, there's yeah. somebody way out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a little new agey for my taste, that kind of approach, but I do appreciate that openness and, mm. and, uh. I think, I think that in an acupuncture session, rather than try to superimpose a cosmology or a, an intent per se, you know, mm -hmm. people love talking about intent and how important it is to get that into the body through the needle. I don't really think that way. I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like if you, if you, if I hold, if I pick a point for some reason, based on the diagnosis or based on touch, wow, this point feels like it needs some attention. I hold my needle. If I don't get the chi feeling, if it doesn't start tingling, 
within 15, 20 seconds, I'll figure I probably picked the wrong point. I'll try something else. But I, I, I'm a big believer in seeing what happens and letting the person just have their experience. And it's really hard to predict what will happen, but mm -hmm. um, it's always interesting. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I do find that, you know, when, when I want healers, when I go to a healer, I want the person that seems the most open and that um, doesn't have an idea what they're going to do, which yeah. is a really weird way to pick a, a <laughs> healer. But yeah. I... I've been to a lot of healers and I don't really want somebody doing something to me, you yeah. know, because I just want to return right to Dow. Yeah. So I just, well, I want someone to watch, right. Observe, sense, feel, and, and maybe help. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, no, it's funny. I have a, I have a massage person here and I, I you know, I was kind of new to Boulder area and I, I was looking for somebody, you know, I had some pain and, and I was like, oh, wow, she studied so many things. She has no idea what she's doing. Like, that's how I'm going to see. <laughs> like, there's, no, there's no commitment here. <laughs> like, uh, and, and things has to be in the pudding. I mean, that's another thing, too. People, yeah. will, people will just say, I want to study Tai Chi, and they'll pick a Tai Chi school out of the phone book or I want acupuncture and they'll just pick an acupuncture. You know, it really has, you just have to try and see if there's some resonance there and that you are getting something out of the experience and that person. And you may or you may not. And whether other people do or don't has no bearing. It just has to be, mm. you just have to see. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And there is this, kind of happenstance quality, I think, with a lot of stuff, just serendipitous meetings with people and connections you make and, yeah. Yeah, and charisma. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we talked for an hour and a half. Um, wow. It's really great talking to you. That, that was fun. I don't see if I have yeah. anything else on my list here. Uh, there's a lot on my list. <laughs> but that was but I don't think we need to cover any of it. Um yeah. uh thank you so much for for thank talking you. and uh let's do it again. And if, you, if you if you ever make it out to Santa Cruz, we should hang out and I'd be happy to give you a treatment. Awesome, awesome. So uh, I'm gonna say goodbye. All right, thank you, Scott. <laughs>